Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, good evening. It's Sunday 26th of September. It's just gone past 8 p.m. My name is uh, Dr. Shakur and I'm one of the regular hosts of MedTalk's uh, book club, uh, Off the Shelf. It's a pleasure to have today the author of our book, Consumed, which is by Arifa Akbar. Brief description, there'll be more in the actual description of this show on YouTube, is Arifa Akbar is the Guardian's chief theatre critic, uh, and I've been following her for many years. Uh, I know she was writing in The Independent before as well, uh, and then moved up to, if you consider it moving up to Guardian, I, I like both papers. Um, and, and she has a regular piece that I do read along with Zubair and many of her, the co-panelists today. The book, I will let Arifa explain in her own words, but in a nutshell is to do with uh, sisterhood, I guess, um, and also the, the sad um, case of her sister dying and, and the many issues to do with that and the um, actual feelings and emotions that evoked and perhaps the sense of journey that took place in Arifa's mind. So we'll hopefully try and untangle that. That's a big ask to do in about 55 minutes to an hour, but we'll do our best. Uh, and forgive us if we don't finish uh, everything by the end of the hour. We also have from India, Dr. Mohammed Munava, um, well past midnight there. Uh, so uh, thank you, Dr. Munava, for coming along. He is a consultant chess physician for over 22 years in Lancashire. For those of you who are doctors in Lancashire, you will know Dr. Munava. Uh, he needs no introduction. But for uh, those of you who aren't in the medical field, he was the former president of the British Thoracic Society in 2020. Um, arguably one of the biggest jobs in respiratory medicine, I would say in the UK, um, along with being maybe editor of Thorax or something of that nature. He also does a lot of international procedures, academic work, he's an honorary professor at University of Central Lancashire, which is the main university in Preston as well with teaching involvement, teaching students and so on. Don't wanna take up the whole evening with your biography, Dr. Munava, but uh, I'll also include that in the description. A warm welcome to you, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts uh, on tonight, TB and the actual book itself. And last by no means least, we have Dr. Zubair Patel, friend and colleague um, of mine. Uh, he's also a GP in Lancashire, in uh, Blackburn. Can we call it sunny Blackburn or maybe not so sunny? Um, and he, he's obviously really enjoyed the book and he's a regular co-presenter of Med Talks Off the Shelf with myself. Um, can I get a hi from all of you before we begin? Hello, lovely Hello. to be here. Thank you Thank for you. Thank you Absolute so much. Pleasure and honor. Thank you for inviting me. Excellent. Good. Um, let's start with Arifa. Arifa, please introduce the book in your own words and explain what it means to you, uh, who it's for, and a little bit about the book. Thank you. Yeah, so it's a book. The book's called Consumed, A Sister Story. Consumed is a title that relates to um, tuberculosis, which is what she died of. She she remained undiagnosed. We're a family that um, moved, that, that my, well, I was born in London, but, but my sister, my older sister, two years older than me, um, spent the early years, first year of her life in Pakistan, Lahore. The family then moved to, to London, where we've been since. Um, and when my sister started feeling ill, um, it she, she was 45 years old and she was having a lot of chest pains and sweats and various other things. And she went uh, and stayed, she had some, you know, two big stays um, in at the Royal Free Hospital, which is a big North London hospital. It's a leading hospital, actually, a research hospital. And they couldn't find what they couldn't find what was wrong with her. They simply couldn't. And she had a massive and fatal brain hemorrhage and, and we were led into a room and they still told us they didn't, they knew she uh, had a brain hemorrhage. They knew that she had HLH, which is uh, a, a something that's symptomatic of something else, but they couldn't say what that something else was. And they said they might not be able to. And the following day, when she was really on a ventilator that she was waiting for that ventilator to be switched off. So her death was certain. They, they produced a diagnosis, too late diagnosis, which was tuberculosis. And that shocked me to the core. It shocked me too in terms of, because I had had so little contact myself with, the me with, with, with medicine, with doctors, with the National Health Service, because I just had had no cause to. My sister had a very different story. She had, uh, she was very much part of the system because she had suffered from eating disorders and also mental health issues, serious mental health issues for years. 
So she, she was very much part of the system. It was all new to me. And I have to say it was a really unpleasant and shocking experience for me, the lack of care, I think, you know, and that's what I felt it was. And the lack of full enough explanation and the too late diagnosis. And really afterwards, we had to chase it up with the doctors to actually get an explanation and to get a little summary of what happened because we were in absolutely... Um, staggered by the, the, the diagnosis. My starting point was that. My starting point was um, a need to understand what led to my sister's death and how it remained. The fact that she died of a very ancient disease with so much mythology around it, and it had remained diagnosed in, in, the, you know, in, in our time. There were so many parts of that element that... that um, confused me I thought and this is very naive naive of me that TB was a thing of the past as far as far as western countries were concerned as far as Europe was concerned I knew that it still uh, it, it was a it, it raged in other parts of the world but I didn't know of the the presence of it here and so so what happened gradually it, subsequently after she died in 2016 was, was um, well, series of unanswered uh, questions and in, inconclusive elements of her death. I felt at first that I just wanted to figure out the medical side of things. That led me on to the, the, the incredible history of this illness and it, it, it's it, the reality of it today. And it led me on to, you know, also to investigate the, you know, TB through art. And, and I'm, I am, I'm an arts journalist. I'm a theatre critic right now, but my history is, is in arts journalism. And, you know, I started looking at paintings. I started going to looking at operas with, with TB. And I, I sort of wanted to, I began with my sister's life and death and, and I opened it up to something bigger. Um, so there's a lot in the book. There is disease, there is family history and fam, you know, very difficult family beginnings and, and dysfunctions there. Uh, there's art, um, there's eating disorder uh, and all of those are sort of, and there's my sister's art because she was an artist and her embroidery. So, so that's, it's all sort of braided together. So it's a very, it, it's actually, well, they're slightly confusing memoirs because it's not just a straightforward memoir of her or me. It's a sort of braiding of many elements. And I wanted to do that. I didn't want to write another grief memoir. You know, as somebody who spent a lot of time reading books, I was a literary editor. I've read some amazing medical memoirs and grief memoirs. And I sort of felt that I couldn't add to those. There in, there's some incredible stuff out there. And so I felt that I wanted to do something broader. TB was new and shocking to me and I wanted to look into that. I talked to you know experts who said, it's very much out there. In fact, I read you know a, a major Lancet report that um, brought lots of experts together from around the world who named TB currently as a pandemic. And that was in 2019, just before our most more recent pandemic. These were great big shocks, but also discoveries for me. So as you say, Fahim, I very much went down, a, but sort of roads of discovery. Um, and the, the, the illness was one major part of it. And actually, I grew utterly fascinated with, with TB. I, I find it fascinating to this day. Um, the fact that we have a cure, but actually it's still, it's so slippery, it still evades us in some contexts. Excellent, that's a profound, uh, beautiful summary of the book. Um, I'd like to come to Dr. Mulan, but what were your initial thoughts uh, on reflection having finished the book? Uh, if you could briefly just say a few words about what the book means to you. Yeah, absolutely uh, fascinating person to say. And I must confess, uh, Arifa, that uh, I read the book on the flight yesterday here from <laughs> Heathrow to Chennai. M well, most of it until I completed it earlier today. And uh, it was uh, well worth every minute uh, that was spent. But uh, no, honestly, it, it, it's just incredible. And even though I'm the TV lead and I've dealt with TV in India where I qualified in Chennai, and in the last 30, nearly 30 years, I've been working in the UK. 
and I, I, I'm the lead for TB in Preston, even though I've dealt with TB up close and personal for so many years, and I teach on TB medical students, foundation doctors, and some of the points that you've made, uh, some key messages, is something that we use in lectures on a regular basis. But in addition, I learned from your book. Oh. Uh, I, honestly, I learned a few things, particularly where you went into things like, I like the history of medicine. I enjoyed history of TB, and I always put in history of TB in my lectures. And I learned something extra about Keats, which you mentioned. And uh, there are other things which hopefully we can pick up and uh, Fahim has summarized. I won't say more at the moment, but I'll pick up as we go along. It's okay. So Thank wonderful you. to hear. Thank you. Yeah. Zubair, your initial thoughts on the book. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, that was a great summary from both of you there. So, I, But in terms of my own personal take, I think when Fahim first mentioned the book to me, I thought a book about grief and death, I thought sounds a bit morose in, in some ways. I must confess, and I thought it would be quite a challenging book club. But having read it, um, it they had, there were lots of celebratory tones to it, which I quite enjoyed. But um, I really enjoyed reading a book about TB and ab about health issues, but from a very different angle. I mean, we used to be the medical journals, aren't we, which are quite dry and informative. But reading a book from somebody who isn't a medic, granted, but actually talks about something that's quite integral to medicine and their take on things, but from a very different angle, an artistic angle was really quite uh, eye-opening. Um, you put in so many different strands and I must confess that there were so many times where I thought, I don't quite understand this side of things. I've not come across this author before, this artist before. And I think it opened up my eyes to a lot of different things. And I think me and Fing were speaking of our affair beforehand about how over the years, maybe medicine has become more scientific than artistic. And I think this kind of gave me an idea of looking at that balance once more. But it read really well. Um, I really enjoyed going through the different chapters we always love books that are less than 300 pages long for him, don't we? And they, again, it hit that target for us really nicely. Um, so yeah, it was great. And it was, I think that one of the beauties was it was so intimate. There were so many things about Fozzie and about your family. And it felt, although that we not met before, that we knew your family really well. Mm. And we, we got to know her well. Uh, and got to know from somebody who loved her and cared for her. Thank you. What lovely. Thank you. For those and still words. loves her, I would say. Yeah. yeah. Uh, present tense. Uh, um, no, thank you to all of you for um, brief descriptions and your thoughts. Let's move on. We have quite a good structure, I hope, for tonight's session, uh, as we do with all our book clubs. The cover and the uh, the title. Arifa, tell us, talk us through this cover, yeah. what it means, the writing, why the consumes going down in the middle. Yeah. Tell us a bit about the cover. So it's funny with the cover because so uh, yeah, there it is. And uh, you know, for me, because I've I'm a journalist. And, and I've been a literary journalist for so long. I thought I knew how publishers put things together. Um, but actually the cover was one of the surprises because um, uh, they, they did the artwork and showed me and they wanted a bit of input, but I got the feeling that they very much had their vision and they were going to stick to it. And they wanted to make it artistic with, and those, those, the sort of pink bits are stitches, you know, so they, they've, they've taken an old photograph of my sister and I in Lahore, where we lived for a year and a half when we were little. And they took that picture of sisters because they wanted to signpost the, what the book was about. And they sort of stitched those those little squiggles. I, I, I'm not sure how much they look like stitches, but that's the idea. And so you're, you, you're being sort of, the, 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 uh, the suggestion is that this is a story of two girls, you know, two, two women that grow, you know, and sisters, and there's an artist, artistic sort of embroidery element to it. I thought of the title and they stuck with it because I know that sometimes publishers don't like the titles that authors suggest. When I started, well, I knew TB as consumption because I'm an English literature, literature graduate and I grew up, you know, I, I, I've been reading the likes of Keats and Dickens and Thomas Mann and, and, and in these sort of um, novels from 19th century, early 20th century, uh, TB is known as consumption. And so I thought I wanted to play on that because this book is about the history of TB as well as, as the, the present day reality. And um, so, so it was a play on cons 
consumption, but it was also a play on um, the idea of her eating disorder, my sister's eating disorder, which was all very, which was very all consuming. Um, and it refers to that idea of consumption. And, um, and actually, the, the fact that this is, re this is also, as well as the, everything else, about grief and grief can be very consuming. So, so, so it's a bit of a play on words. And the, um, I'm not sure how much this cover actually explains what the book is about, but it hints at it. There's lots of suggestions of what it might be about. And when they presented this idea to me, you know, very late in the day, the day they show you their artwork, the publisher, and they sort of say, here's what we've thought of. I was quite struck by it. It's quite an intense cover. I hadn't expected it to be so intense, but, you know, I went along with it, it was eye-catching, and it had all those suggestions there, so we stuck with that. It's interesting you mentioned the stitching, uh, and I'll go to Dr. Malava, you want to come in there, because we had some other thoughts as to what that was. Really? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was struck by this cover more after having read the book. Because I thought, the way I looked at it, consumed, let, uh, as you said, consumption. For instance, the Royal Brompton Hospital, as it is now, was a hospital of consumption in those days. It was called the Hospital of Consumption for TB. If you go back to the 20th century, um, uh, early on, oh, sorry, actually the 19th century. 19th. Sorry, 19th century. And the way I looked at it, also these red tards, being a medic and being a little bit narrow-minded when it comes to medic, these are acid fast bacilli. This is what acid fast bacilli, tuberculous bacilli look like under the microscope. So fun I, I, yes, uh, funnily enough, what you say, I talked to one TB expert and he was describing, you know, my sister's sort of TB and he said it's like millet-like, millet-like seeds almost. And now that you've said what you said, yes, they do, you know, I can see why you'd think it. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely right. Miliary TB is described because of millets like seeds on the chest X-ray on the CT scan. But these rods like bacilli are what they look like under the microscope when you stain the specimen. If you take a specimen of sputum or a specimen from inside the lungs and you stain, they use a special stain called a zeal nielsen stain. And that stain under the microscope, it's, this is often a quiz question in medicine, even in medical school. So I looked at it. And third, uh, secondly, when you describe the picture with your sister and the terrace in Lahore, um, I mean, I, I, because my childhood was spent in Chennai and we know those terrace pictures are very popular as children, they dress them up often in the same outfit. Um, you know, one piece of cloth, you, you've created the outfit for all. The, I, have five, I have five brothers. So all of these together, and we used to line up on the terrace. I looked at this consumed going there in between to imply uh, the sensitive relationship you had with your mm. sister. There were periods where we are in, incredibly close mm. and there were periods where there's separation that you described so beautifully in your book. Uh, and I, I looked at it like that. I mean, I, just because I read it, uh, I'm sorry, just a bit of imagination, I think, probably. But that's what it meant to me. It's very good symbolism. And I hadn't thought of it. But yes, it's a sort of division, isn't it? Because there was estrangement. So I see why you would think it. And maybe that's what the publisher was trying to achieve. So, yeah. I know Zubair and I discussed that. And we came to the same conclusion as Dr. Malava. So uh, Zubair, I'll come on to a different question for you. Um, speaking more about the book in general terms, I mean, have you got any memorable passages, Zubair, you want to share with the audience or what you found uh, something that sticks in the memory or what you found most enjoyable in the book? It's always difficult to kind of pin down one thing when you read these sort of books because there's so many different things that you enjoy. Um, one thing I'll mention, because it's an artistic book uh, and you, you mentioned that you'd met um, a, a, a painter who told you how to look at a, a painting and actually look with your eyes and actually look at what you're seeing. And it reminded me of uh, a quote from, um, from a famous physician called William Osler, who would always say that, listen to your patient, he or she was giving you the diagnosis. Uh, so that was quite good to kind of see that actually there's a, even though when you look at works of art, I think for, for myself as, a, as someone with a more of a scientific background, it's difficult to determine what's, what's actually is going on. Although obviously with this, it was a bit more clearer to me, actually with, the, with regards to the cover. I enjoyed that side of things in terms of learning from an artist that actually when we're working as physicians or as, as TB physicians or as GPs, that although we do listen to patients to, to hear the diagnosis, there's actually an element of looking as well. 
because part of our job is to have a heightened sense of our senses and actually listen to our, our hearing better and pay attention to more to what we're seeing as well to kind of gain uh, an appreciation of what the patient is presenting with and actually learn from them. So for me, that was the biggest thing I took because it made me think about my job a bit more and actually using it more for practice. So although it, there's more of an artistic reference to it, I think it kind of gave me some support in terms of thinking actually hear the patient, but also look at them as well. So when I do see a painting from in the future, I might pay a bit more attention to what I'm looking at as opposed to just skimming through it. Excellent. Arifa, obviously you wrote the book. What, what's your favourite part of the book? Can you share that with us? Um, a favourite part of the book, favourite. Uh, there were lots of, you know, moments of discoveries that were really exciting. Um, that's hard, you know. I went to um, Rome. I went to, this is a very artistic, this is a very non-medical, you know, part of the book that I enjoyed uh, researching. I went to Rome and I, I, look, I went to, in a way, um, well, visit uh, the, la, the, the room in which Keats um, died. Keats was a poet who, in the 19th century, who um, suffered from TB. He, there was a sort of race against time uh, when he knew, you know, he coughed up blood, arterial blood, and he knew that was, he called it his death warrant. He knew, he recognised it straight away. His brother had died of TB. It, it, you know, everybody died of, everybody could diagnose TB at that time because it was raging across, you know, Britain. And so he knew he was going to die. And in a last ditch attempt, um, to try and save himself, he was, you know, in his twenties. His 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 friends uh, clubbed around, got enough money for for to send him to Italy, and they believed then, you know, warmer climate might just give him extra life or might turn his condition round. And so he went from North London. You know, he he went to to Rome as as a way as as an attempt, a final attempt to to live. Um, and he didn't, but, you know, there's, there's a room there at Keats Shelley House in um, Rome in which he, he lived and died in, those, in that final, you know, part of his life. And I went to see that room. I also went to see his grave, you know, in the Protestant cemetery in, in Rome. And then while I was there, I remembered that my sister, you know, she, she had very bad depression for, for her entire life. And I think the first bout of really serious depression when she was 19 and she, we, uh, I suddenly when I was in Rome, I sort of made the connection that when, you know, in the midst of that first very big depression, um, she, are, she, she, she had friends who were going to Rome and she, you know, my mother bought her an air ticket and she went off to Rome and she went to the Sistine Chapel and she saw its art and it was very, very uh, uplifting for her. And I remember she came back transformed, you know, and that's the, that was the power of, of the art that she, that she encountered there. It sort of cha changed her um, for a while at least. And, and um remedied that that first bout of depression for a while and so I went to the Sistine Chapel and it was very very moving and I and I and that was a turning point actually because I think the the magnitude of the you know life and death and all the rest of you know God and the devil and heaven and earth and all of those things that you know, Michelangelo um, emblazoned across the walls of, of the Sistine Chapel. I think, you know, we're, we're actually staring up at it for many hours. I stayed there, you know, staring up at this magnificent um, biblical, you know, very religious, very spiritual, even beyond the Bible. It was just a very spiritual experience. Um, um, looking up at this, thinking, finding some perspective around you know, my grief, my sister's death, um, all of our lives and deaths, in fact. Um, so so that, was a, that was a turning point, in which I let quite a lot of the, um, the bad parts of my sister's death go, you know, and the anger and the frustration around the lack of diagnosis. Um, and that, that was a very moving moment for me to be in Rome, to be, you know, looking at these, these things and, and to be going on that journey. There was another... Um, 
wonderful moment even though it might seem very sad uh, at her funeral because we're Muslims we bury our dead very quickly um swiftly so so you know her her death and that's hard in a sense because you know someone's died and before you know it they're being packed away you know in a funeral and there's something very shocking but therapeutic too you know in in that kind of funeral I found but we you know there was the, it, the funeral had very few people in, there. You know, it was a weekday. It was a f two, two days after her death and um, it had some relatives, but there were not enough to carry the, the coffin. And, and I was just very worried. I was thinking, how is this coffin going to get from here to there? And suddenly, you know, a whole gang of my brother's friends came. You know, they, they'd taken the day off work and they marched in and they'd known us since the age of, you know, five, six, and they'd grown up with us and, um, you know, more than friends. There were real sort of brothers for my 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 brother. And that was a great moment. You know, that was a wonderful sort of memorable moment. It's a sort of little miraculous thing that they just turned up and and um, that that was a very important and, and actually um, that was a, a good day, if I can say that of a funeral. Um, so 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 I suppose, yeah, those are two moments in the book that for me were important moments so many others as well though you know looking through my sister's medical records and they were huge I mean they were a pile of many inches and at first I was very intimidated because I'd got them from the hospital and I left them under the you know under the table for many many months and then when I decided that I was writing the book and I was writing the book in last year's pandemic over six months so I was writing it quite quickly I was forced to go back and look at those medical records and actually that was that was its own revelation you know I have no idea I have no contact with with doctors and, and, and the medical world and it, it felt as if I was you know at first learning a different language I was I was encountering an, a world I'd never I had no insight into and the notes said so much, you know, they said so much, even though there's no emotional depth to those notes, they are all, you know, tabulations of what was happening to my sister's bodies and the tests taking, being taken and what she was eating and what her body was doing and, you know, ECGs. So in some senses, they were completely dry. And another, they were incredibly intimate record of both my sister's, you know, struggling body, but also, the doctors struggled, this very human side of medicine. And I think that's what I hadn't really, um, really meditated on the humanness of medicine. Of course, we have a cure for TB, you know, of course, you know, we have the cure, but that doesn't mean that, that, that that's not the end of, or the beginning of the story. Um, and, yeah, it, it gave me a lot of insight about, you know, the explorations of, of a, a team of doctors, perhaps, you know, the issues, because there was a medical record that said there were missed opportunities and you could see how big this team was. You know, perhaps you could see, I could see the attempts, you know, many attempts being taken to, 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 to figure out what this thing was that was, that was attacking my sister's body from inside and you could see the wrong turnings you know it was the humanness the humanity in those notes that was another important um moment for me thank you um there's a lot to unpick then i'm going to move on to tb and grief moving on from that i think something that just struck me from what you said uh one of my teachers said, obviously, how can you be a good human if you don't have an appreciation of the humanities? And there's quite a lot behind that. And I think it's something as medics, we're always trying to remember or should remember as how the humanities can influence our medical practice. And it's not simply a scientific uh, practice in a silo, but there are humanities and the art is involved. And we will talk about that time permitting. So as I said, uh, TB and grief, Dr. Munava, the TB expert, are you able to give us uh, just a few minutes, just for the audience, a little bit about uh, TB and how it's represented in the book as well, if you could just uh, illuminate the, the audience. Absolutely, Brahim. Uh, just before I do that, I wanted to mention something to Arifa, uh, talking about favorite moments, and there were many, and related to TB as well. But I liked uh, the way you described having been brought up with Bollywood around me, although I'm not, I don't watch as much, 
that we describe uh, Mughal Azam and Anarkali and the city in Lahore, etc. And also talking about Bollywood, you're, you're, what you just said about the funeral, and you were wondering who's going to pick up the, uh, you know, your, your sister and your Tariq's friends appearing from out of the blue to to help out. That was like a Bollywood movie to to me. And uh, uh, talking about TV, uh, and, and every TV uh, lecture that I do, and because it's related to the question that Fahim has asked, I always put in a quiz about celebrities with TV. But there is because there's a there's a misconception that TV TV occurs only in the poor, deprived. Yeah. areas of Africa and India and you know the Pakistan mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. the Bangladesh there's a misconception so I always put up this uh, picture one of the celebrities that I show is uh, Keats uh, always and I talk a little bit about Keats and but uh, and how actually he was sent to mountainous areas uh, apparently in one writing and then as you say about uh, sunny areas to see whether TB will, uh, will be cured and there's lots written in history about this aspect for instance Samuel Johnson apparently had scrofula derma, but uh, they used to line up outside the Queen's Palace. I don't know how far it's true that they used to line up and to, to wait for the Queen's uh, touch to get them better. And Samuel Johnson, being a VVIP, bypassed the queue and went in and didn't get cured. And then they realized the sunlight, which is helping and not the Queen's touch. <laughs> but TB, there's lots of interesting anecdotes about TB, but uh, Prince Sahim has asked about TB, but the things, the headlines with TB are this, as you rightly pointed out, um, TB is a disease which is curable. In fact, more than 95% of patients with TB can, uh, can expect complete cure. And there are very few conditions in medicine where you can boast about, of more than 95% complete cure. That's the beauty about dealing with TB. But the challenge with dealing with TB is making a diagnosis. And you've spoken to an expert, that global expert in your book you mentioned, Professor Francis Drobnowski. I was talking about the index of suspicion. One of the things we always teach from medical school is to always maintain a high index of suspicion when it comes to TB. So much so in TB endemic areas where there's very high incidence, for instance, when I was in medical school in Chennai, one of our professors used to say, they always think TB first. And he almost went on to say, and this is a bit, uh, and I would say powerful, um, but he always used to say, if you're uncertain about a diagnosis, nobody has a right to die without a trial of anti-TB treatment and steroids, signifying the importance of considering TB in a TB endemic area where TB is rampant mm. and always think of TB. So the endemicity, and in your book, you highlight another very important aspect where you read the notes and so many experts have coming together. And when we have a lesson for medicine and that when we have in TB, Diagnosis can be straightforward if you suspect it, and if you have the right specimens, and if you have the right tests, and we have very good tests at the, at the moment for TB, but some tests are delayed, as you correctly mentioned there. But maintaining the high index of suspicion and initiating the diagnosis and treatment is important. Also in the book, you describe about the how rampant TB is, and you talked about the fact that one third of the human population is infected. Absolutely right. Um, you've talked about uh, you know, how in uh, 10, 10 million people die out of TB. There's a lot about TB and I don't want to you know, take up too much time, but I don't know whether this is what you wanted for him or you want me to say anything more. No, that's great. Yeah, it, just to uh, flesh out the bits that uh, Arifa mentioned about TB with your expertise. So that's great. Um, I think if you could talk a little bit about ethnicity, obviously Arifa sister is South Asian background. Could you link that uh, back to ethnicity a bit? Yeah, so the highest incidence of TB is an Asian and African population, but in those people who are born abroad, it's higher in those people who are born abroad. Any group if you take, whether it's Asian, African, Caribbean, or even a Caucasian, if they are born abroad in an endemic area, because most of TB is acquired in early years of life and it lies dormant. And you, you allude to in your book very nicely that bit and it's reactivates in, during periods of stress or immune suppression of some sort, whether it's medication related, whether it's uh, maybe prolonged periods of physical, emotional stress, it tends to reactivate. It lies dormant, grabs that opportunity to surface and attack during that time. So ethnicity is important. In fact, that's the reason BCG is targeted more to people of South Asian heritage, although BCG itself is not completely protected. Mm, mm. 
and people come to me and said, oh, I've had my BCG, so it can't be TB, doctor. Mm-hmm. When I say TB is in the diagnosis, in the uh, top of the di- differential diagnosis list. Um, and uh, there are lots of misconceptions about TB. Excellent. That's great. Zubair, uh, I've left you in the cold for a while. Let's bring you back into the discussion. Grief is a, a big part of the book, and I want the whole panel to talk about it now. Um, I think it's fair to say that everyone's experienced grief, uh, not necessarily just the pandemic, but just generally in life. If you've got to a certain age, I think grief has touched us all. We all have different ways to cope. The book talks in, I would say, huge detail about art as a coping mechanism or perhaps retracing the steps of a loved one physically, geographically. That's one of the methods that I think that's used. Um, but Zubair, what's your uh, impression about exploration of grief in the book, how to cope and different ways uh, people try and cope with grief. Thank you, Finn. Yeah, obviously the book is, you know, covers the loss of your sister and, and that's obviously quite an important aspect of the book in terms of how one copes after losing somebody so close to them. Um, what I liked in the book was how you'd mentioned how others have also coped with grief, but also your own little journey uh, with regards to that too. What was interesting for me though, was how much art formed that side of things and, and how you used art to cope. Because although we, we do refer patients for art therapy for things like depression and for grief, um, I've never seen it firsthand. I've never spoke to someone and said, actually, what do you do? Or what do you actually go through? But to see somebody go through it in such an in-depth manner, it, it became really quite uh, eye-opening for me. Uh, and it made me think also about, well, when I've been through episodes of losing a loved one. I've actually never used art in that manner myself. So it was an interesting thing because I thought actually, I've never used it personally, but it's something to, to reflect on and the learning point in terms of actually, this is a, a, an option for people and it may be an option for, for others who, who sadly have lost a loved one. Because um, in general, we, we all have mechanisms of coping with different stresses. It might be sport, it might be going for reading a book, it might be um, talk to the family and loved ones. There might be things that you mentioned, obviously, there with regards to the rigid side of things and how that formed a bit of support there during the prayer, for example. And obviously, some of us that have gone through would, would have used family, uh, would have used maybe friends, would have used maybe our faith also to support us through it. Um, but, but what I found really interesting with the, within the book was how you used art to kind of get you get, get you into a position where you could reflect on things. But it was a journey. It never seemed to be a case of you did it for like a week or a month or a year. It, it seems to be like, a, and I, I don't, I'm like, I would be wrong. I could be wrong maybe, but it seems as though it, that process is ongoing. Mm. And there's still um, a journey there that you're having uh, and that you've explored already, but maybe there'll be more um, twists and turns and maybe uh, periods where you get some sort of enlightenment. What I also found quite, quite good was how there was a, a, a piece of what the sister had made about the, the, the spines. Oh, yeah. uh, and I thought that was quite really, um, that was quite eye-opening because sometimes you think about, I know Fahim, I think we was speaking today about, you know, um, writing emails to your son and, and saying that he may never get to a stage where you're around when he reads them. Uh, but you do sometimes think that actually for your children or for loved ones, if there was something posthumous that they could reflect on mm. that you left behind for them, how useful would that be? So it was, for me, that was food for thought. I don't know whether that was um, your, your sister's intention, whether that was what she was hoping to achieve from that piece of work. But it was really quite eye-opening for me that actually there's strategies that people can employ and, and things you can employ to kind of help your loved ones after you've gone and, and help them to kind of cope with the grief. Obviously, we mentioned that you've, you've you know, that there are different ways that people cope. And, and I know that in the past, obviously, we lean heavily on things from a religious perspective. I know, obviously, for him, we'll probably say the same for him too. And obviously that gives you some sort of solace about, because obviously death can be an interface between different worlds. And obviously that gives you a, an aspect of, of support there. Um, but, but I really love the fact that there were some practical things that you brought out. Uh, and I love the, the journey that you took because to, to hear somebody's story in that much detail, but from somebody who really appreciates art and actually understands art to such a depth was really quite eye-opening for me. I want to come to you, Arifa, this bit because the grief is of a sibling and I guess I want to pose the question to you. Um, 
is that different than the grief, say, if it had been your parent? I think maybe society prepares you to a degree, although nothing will prepare you for grief, that there's an order to grief. Yes, you yes don't very expect, much. You don't expect to bury your children, but it can happen. You expect that your parents will die and then the siblings and then the children, you know, these sort of things, you'll go and then your children. But that's not what we have here. We have mm. your sibling dying. Yes, admittedly, a bit older, but still your sibling. Mm. How was that? And is that a bit of something worth exploring in the actual book itself? Um, that Could you just say a few words about that? Yeah, I think it, you're right. It's the shock of that, that, that the natural order of things being interrupted. And I think there's an assumption we all make that in, maybe it's an entitlement to life, which is completely wrong. This idea that, yeah, our parents will die before us, you know, then it's us and our children will be left behind. And, and that's the order that must always be followed. And that really, that's really how life happens. And of course it doesn't, because as you say, you know, children die and, and all sorts of things happen, you know, to, to disrupt that order. And in the case of my sister, she had always had big issues you know she had as I've said the eating disorder the depressions and um that's not to say that you know her death I saw the death her death coming in any way in fact what alarmed me was the shock of it I think it was just quite sudden and of course you know um you know as you said you know the TB TB is often dormant so so it was there but the way in which it took grip seemed quite fast. And so there was a shock of something, you know, ambushing her body and, and sort of taking grip so quickly and her declining so quickly. Um, and, and also the, the, the shock of the fact that, you know, Western medicine just couldn't get their head around what it was and then it turned out to be this ancient disease. There's, there's such a big irony. There's such a big sort of shock for me there. Uh, so I think those, those things added to the grief in a way. You know, I think grief is grief. The loss of someone, whether they're 90, you know, or as my sister was 45, um, is entirely, I think, unique and it doesn't always correlate with age you know it correlates with so many other things how close you were what um issues there were between you and the person you've just lost um how de the dependency i mean there's a whole load of things and yes the order in which you expect things to happen is an issue but there's more to grief than that i think you know and i wouldn't be able to grade grief you know I, um, that I was entitled to feel more shocked. You know, I think it's also personal, isn't it? I think for, for, from my perspective, my personal experience of grief has been actually um, very small. And I think that's because um, partly to do with the fact that we're, we're an immigrant family, you know, we left behind the larger extended family circle and we came to London we lived as a very small unit you know there's the five of us and of course deaths around in the larger family the wider circle happened but we were we were very very removed from those people you know I'd lost touch with my aunts and uncles and you know the grandparents I'd been so close to when I was a child and in Pakistan for a year and a half those people became sort of you know distant and very removed by the time I was an adult so when they died uh, the grief that I felt was actually very different from somebody that you know family around you that uh, and so I was in a way very removed from grief until my sister's death which happened to come before both my my father is 90 and he's got dementia but he's alive and my mother is 76 and she's alive you know she's she's old but alive so so it was my first experience of of grief and and you know I think in the western world some of us are, are very are very much you know separated from and and removed from ideas and discussions of death you know there's levels of denial there 
And while I'm from, you know, I'm from a religion that really does um, face up to death, I think, my experience just didn't chime with that. You know, I, you know, we talk about in Islam, we often talk about life and death and the hereafter. And, um, but that was very conceptual for me until this, the first person in that unit of five died. And then suddenly it became my first enc serious encounter with death up close. Dr. Manafa, you're a doctor as well, and uh, grief, and uh, whether it be personal, if you wish to disclose or not, or professional, that you must deal with grief a lot. Um, do you want to say a few words just to add to what has been said already on grief? Absolutely. I mean, uh, both Zubair and Arif have covered it beautifully, and, and Arif, of course, has described it very nicely in the book. And, um, and we've seen grief in different forms, more so in the COVID, during the COVID pandemic, where they couldn't even meet their near and dear uh, till late, which was uh, a totally different thing. So we were there almost uh, experiencing the grief through FaceTime or whatever uh, till the end. And that was completely, this is completely a different world. Uh, uh, Arifa, in case you don't know, we deal with COVID a lot. We cover COVID service all the time. So we, we've seen this uh, very close quarters. Um, but grief and art so very nicely described in your book, and Zubair has picked that up already, so I don't want to repeat in the interest of time. But what came through to me was the, the, the relationship between the fact that Fazia was a, an incredible talent. She was amazing talent, wasn't she, when it came to art? And you picked it up and brought it in to the book to describe so much of her talent and, and I don't know whether that is also uh, the ability or uh, one way of helping you grieve. I, I just wondered because, uh, you know, even this morning I went to a hospital where my mother died sometime back and I was just in the office where I had picked her up in the ambulance after she had passed away. And, paid, you know, and the, the, the way you describe certain instances in your book reminded me of that sort of connection. Uh -huh. um, and uh, people grieve differently. We've seen it. I mean, art, we've seen music, we've seen meditation, religion, sport, exercise. And you picked up many elements of that in the book. And that's what I uh, really appreciated while reading the book. But you, yeah, you've really touched on um, things I haven't said, actually. I mean, one of, I think, I can't remember, maybe Zubair, you touch, touched on it. But, oh, no, sorry, you've just touched on the fact that COVID, you know, dealing with COVID in the last year and this past year and a half, um, and and that must change so many people's relationships with grief and death, including not just doctors, but you know, everybody and across the globe. And and the thing with my sister is it was a hospital death, and actually it was a death in which we had PPE on. And this was before the the. This, we knew what PPE was you know, before the whole world began wearing PPE. And so in a way, it felt really, it feels really odd now to think back, you know, to that, you know, to that sort of death by infectious disease. And that, that was a few years before all of us would experience that. And the sadness of a hospital death, the clinical elements and the, you know, the, the very, the sort of lack of intimacy that hospitals can offer because they're hospitals and actually hospitals are geared not to accommodating death but to saving life and so they're not you know in my experience it was not a um, good place to die and and a good place to grieve so there was that element but I have to say with the art the fact that we had she had she had done so much art and that it was there left for us after her death was really a gift in a way to me because what I was trying to do with with my grief it's not so much get over it or have therapy this wasn't thera therapeutic to write and I didn't I think grief takes its own time I don't think you know I think it, it you know you do what you can and it and and it metabolizes in its within its own pace you, you you know you just you have to ride with it and um but so it wasn't that I wanted catharsis or that I wanted you know therapy art as therapy it was that I just really wanted to understand who she was but also understand grief as and death as as a thing in the world you know I'd never really grappled with the the, the big issue of what is 
death? What is grief? What is life? You know, all of these very big questions. And because she'd left this cachet of art, I really it was a great uh, legacy in a way, you know, the things that people leave behind. And these were, this was her imagination, her creativity, but a lot of her ideas, you know, are there in her art. And so I, I really had the privilege of looking at, at that artwork, thinking about what it meant for her, what she was saying, who she was in the world. And that side was therapeutic. You know, this, even though I wanted to understand grief and life and death through the art, it actually was very healing to see, because I could see who she was a lot better. A bit like, you know, for him, you said about emails left to your son. You know, they're in a way things that you leave him to show him who you are. And, and, you know, my sister was showing us who she was through her artwork, and we still have that. You know, these are parts of her that will remain in the world. So really, they're, they're a great gift, these, these works of art. Um, so, so, yeah, the, the art functioned like that in, in relation to grief. Excellent. I know time is always against us. Uh, oh, yeah, I, and we've only got a few unless uh, I can get permission for an extra 10 minutes. If you can't agree, then just write on the chat function. But I think there's still a lot more I just want to get in the next 15 minutes. Um, Zubair, I want to come on. We've talked about grief. That links in nicely with legacy and the concept of how we want to be remembered. Obviously, Arifa has written a book about how she remembers her sister. I mean, Zubair, you can either talk about how you want us to remember you or, or just uh, in, in just general life. Uh, is legacy an important issue? It may not even be important to you, but do you go through and walk through life thinking, um, you know, how do I want to be actually remembered by those I leave behind? It's a tough one, isn't it? Because um, you tend to think of legacy as something that others think about as opposed to... Um, what you do. So, because obviously our journeys are, are what they are, and, and at times your journey might feel um, quite unfulfilled for some people, um, but for you, you may feel very fulfilled in what you're doing. Um, but I think the aspect of legacy, I think for some, can be quite pressured as well, because you might think, well, what have I truly achieved in my time um, compared to maybe X, Y, Z? So I think it's quite a personal aspect. Obviously, there'd be no of historical figures and we know of people in throughout history who everyone remembers and everybody knows their name uh, and will know their name, whether it's for good or bad reasons, uh, through the end of time. Um, I think for me, it's, it's quite more personal. I think it's given um, the job we do and, and family and, and that sort of thing. I think you probably more focus on those aspects as opposed to one's own personal legacy. Um, and I think the legacy you probably leave behind is more about what you do with regards to your work uh, and what you do with regards to um, the people you meet and, and what you do with them. And I think I would just probably just leave my legacy to those who I leave behind to kind of just come to terms with, uh, as opposed to making a, a conscious effort to think, well, actually, if I went tomorrow, what would they think about me or, or next week? And, and what should I do to change that perception or, or whatnot? Because uh, I think we're, we're on our journey, aren't we, through life? And sometimes your journey in life may be um, useful to you but may not be useful to others and, and other times it might be actually really good for, for what you're doing for yourself but also to the your people that you love and maybe to be in, the, in your wider community or society in general um, but I think it's really hard to kind of for me anyway to be in a position to say actually my legacy will be this and, and I've, I'm, not, I'm ready for it and I've, I've really prepared for that maybe I should do <laughs> maybe I should do but I think right now I'm not quite in that position we can get a statue for you in Blackburn later. Yeah. There. <laughs> I refer, I mean, obviously writing, I think books, uh, your written work is a form of legacy. I think that's obvious to say, goes without saying. But what do you see as your legacy as well? Obviously, you talk mm. about your relationship as an aunt. Uh, do you see that mm. as part of your legacy as well? And maybe if you want to talk a little bit about your brother, we haven't really heard much about him in the uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, legacy. So, so, yeah, there is, I am an aunt. I don't have children myself. So there's not that legacy to leave the world. Um, yeah, there's writing, there's a book, there's, you know, the, I don't, so I'm not caught up with legacy and I'm not sure, I have a father who's got dementia and I see the way memory works and, and it makes me think, is remembering the most important thing? You know, do I, is it the most important thing for me to be remembered after I die? For heaven's sake, we're all forgotten eventually. Shakespeare isn't, but, you know, we're all forgotten and I don't think I need to be remembered 
when I, you know, I don't think I need that. But I, I do think I'd like to leave an emotional legacy, which means I'd like to have to to stay as a um, useful presence in people's thoughts to if I have been useful. So with the nieces, for example, I hope I've given them a few sort of tips on life or an approach to life to, to, to do what you love, to do things with joy. I hope those things, uh, you know, which I, which I think I project to them because that's how I feel about life. I hope they'll, to some degree, carry that through and remember that rather than me because I don't need to be remembered I'll be dead <laughs> um I, I think it's good in life to be useful and to do meaningful things I mean that that for me you know in the present I, I I hope I'm doing meaningful things by writing a book by doing my journalism by being a good aunt by being a, a good daughter um and a and a loving friend and um you know, so I, I hope I'm doing that in the present, but I don't need that in itself remembered. I think, um, yeah, you know, to pass on certain a certain approach to life um, to my friends, to the nieces. Um, I think my brother has got the legacy. You know, he's he, he his he's got that traditional legacy. So he's got his two girls. You know, to to leave in the world um and he sh you know that's shared by me um to some degree so um yeah I, I just think this you know how will I be remembered I, I think that's really wrapped up in ego um for me you know it's all different for different people and I don't at all judge people who want to leave a legacy and some and you know my sister's left a very physical legacy which I've just said is really important to us um she did that because she happened to be an artist and and you know scientists who discover all sorts of things and medics who you know nobel prize winners leave immensely important legacies so i think legacy is is as an important thing i just for me i don't need to be remembered <laughs> It's not important. I think some of the things that I've, I hope I've left in the world, those things might be remembered. Excellent. Just last 10 minutes, sir, I want to actually come to you, Dr. Malavo. If you talk I about said, legacy. Said two things. Yeah. Go on, I, said two things, I think the first thing is, I think, um, I would probably say to Reefa that by writing the book anyway, you probably left a legacy with me, and I'm sure to Fahim, Fahim and Dr. Munoba anyway, in terms of how we think about art and, and, and science. I think the second thing is, if it can oh, be a bit of a double-edged sword thing as well, thank can't it? Because if you look at, thank you. But if you look at about William Carlston, for example, or think about um, uh, the statue issues right now that's occurring within the nation and maybe in other parts of the world too, it might be a bit of a double-edged sword as well. So I don't think I want a statue well, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. This is really important, what you touch on, which is broader than the book. But it's funny, isn't it? What we memorialise and then 50 years later, we can look at that memorialization very critically and question it. Yes. And that is one of the interesting things of how, how that legacy evolves and becomes toxic or become, comes to be seen as toxic. Um, and, it, it, you know, and he was celebrated and now he's not and he shouldn't be. And, and that's, that shows a very moving that the world, the statue says the same, but the world really changes its thoughts around it as it should be you know there's something very alive around that that good um so yeah as i said we're near the end so uh, dr Malaf, i want to come to you briefly if you can talk about legacy although i think your biography in itself is a legacy but uh, if there's anything that you consider how you want to be remembered and then we'll move on to eating disorders uh, and learning points for doctors in the healthcare profession and call it a night right dr Malava, can you yeah, tell us a little uh, about about legacy whether professionally or from a non-professional perspective for you yeah, very, I'll be very brief uh, for him and very kind words uh, that you, you just stated there. I mean, uh, people think as profession, I talk about profession, that people often feel that when somebody comes and says in the clinic that uh, such and such a time, you actually saved my life, uh, doctor, and we, we think it gives us satisfaction. And always I point out to the patient and they think I'm immodest, but I point out to the patient that uh, saving somebody's life or doing something is actually a team effort. Uh, I might have seen the person, but there are lots of other players involved. It's not my single-handed effort. Um, but what I do remember is uh, is teaching. When I, I mean, yesterday I went, I came to a hospital to see actually in Chennai 
to see people uh, to see for a uh, you know uh, relative. But there are two things that I met bumped into doctors. I said one that uh, 12 years ago I taught them a procedure which they are practicing on a regular basis. And some other person that I met, I met a group of doctors, and somebody said 30 years ago as a medical student, I taught him somebody that he that he remembers. And those sort of things we remember. But in the book, coming because you're talking about Arifa's beautiful book, in the book you make a very interesting point that st struck a chord with me, which is something we try and teach. You emphasize the importance of compassion and care and communication with the relatives. And you also say that many patients remember the doctors that they've seen previously because they had been kind to them and said something kind to them, some kind communication. And that's it's such, 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 it's forgotten because that's the kind of legacy actually we should be aiming for. Like you rightly said, otherwise we will be forgotten. All of us will be forgotten for what you've done. People may remember these days, but be forgotten. But that act of uh, that kind communication mm. during a time when they patients and the relatives are the most vulnerable self, that is what's going to be remembered. Mm. I'll stop I there. Next I couldn't time. agree more. I mean, uh, well, we had a visitor to my dad's home uh, who shall remain unnamed in case he doesn't want to be uh, mentioned. But he was saying, you know, for him, there's different ways to be remembered. But it's how you treat people you remember. So if you want to be remembered as someone who's just a go-getter and just, you know, treats people like trash, you know, keep doing that. Not to me specifically, also, but just generally say. But if you don't want to, then, you know, people remember if you were kind and helpful and these sort of things. And in the end, that's going to be part of your legacy. And, and that was only a few days ago, but I thought that was quite memorable. Arifa, eating disorders, it would be remiss of us doctors as well to talk about a book yeah. without talking about eating disorders. Yeah. It, it, we're not, we don't have enough time to give it its full worth, but I will put some links in the description yeah. for people who it might uh, respond to that, who are going through a difficult time uh, with an eating issue. Can you tell us a little bit about the audience, about your own eating issues you may have and yeah. how we can perhaps help those? Yeah, I mean, I think eating disorders are, um, yeah, tricky, you know, by what I've, I've, I've delved into the reading and, and, and experienced my own, but my sister's eating disorder sort of um, was, was much more acute and extreme and lifelong and actually really um, took over her life. And it was a sort of compulsive eating disorder, but also anorexia and bulimia uh, and, you know, over many decades and um, began with sort of binge eating for both of us actually as teenagers it's all sort of recreational we didn't and I don't it's very hard to, people have asked me you know how why why how do you think why do you think you know that happened to you and what what was going on and I don't know I think that there's a, a confluence you know there's a combination of things that were happening you know t being a teenager having suffered poverty being uh, having the immigrant trauma um, finding a, 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 some sort of outlet in in food uh, addiction compulsion you know all those elements it could have it might have been another compulsion that would have taken grip but as it happened it was food and food is very difficult it's a very difficult addiction to navigate compulsion to navigate because you've got to negotiate with food and meals many times a day you know it's not something you can avoid so um my sister suffered you know sort of eating disorders throughout her life and was very um and actually at the hospital where she was she was um you know where she died for, for many decades, she'd been treated there for eating disorders and they, there wasn't that joined up thinking that because, you know, TB is, is it, eating disorder and malnutrition is one of the, one of the signs, you know, one of the vulnerabilities and that leaves you open to, to TB. Um, I don't know what I can say in a rush other than um, in eating disorder you know it's very it, I saw with my sister there was so many attempts to overcome it and it's a very hard uh, disorder to treat and and I'm not sure whether she yeah no no she was certainly not in any level of recovery um, and she'd had a lot of um, psychiatric help and any every other sort of help that she could get with eating disorder. I think that now we're beginning to speak about it and some of the stigma that has been around eating eating disorders for so long is isn't isn't there it's it's less there. Um, I think binge eating disorders are not talked about very much and um, 
I think when I have gone to the doctor and said, this is happening and can you, and the doctor was actually, you know, it was a male doctor took it seriously and was really helpful and referred me to an eating disorder unit at a hospital, which wasn't actually very helpful. But in terms of the GP response, I really was impressed at how the GP listened and was really, really very helpful. And, you know, there are, there are, avenues you know I was first sent for CBT and then on to the eating disorder unit so so there are those those ways to contend with it and and places you can go for help um, I think the only problem with my sister is, is she tried all of those avenues and exhausted them and it was just she was just overwhelmed by how extreme it was I will let you have the final word, Arif, about the book and learning points for doctors and healthcare professionals. So if you can just think about that and I'll come back to you. Dr. Munava, anything you want to mention about eating disorders that you see or even learning points for doctors or healthcare professionals having read this book? Yeah, I think uh, it, uh, Arif has highlighted many key messages and if you have a chance, I'll summarize at the end. But with regard to eating disorders, I think, uh, uh, unfortunately, my experience is that it, it, although it's prevalent, there's a waiting list which has uh, gone up even further during the pandemic. Unfortunately, for the specialist service of eating disorders, this has been recognized by the NHS teams nationally. Uh, but one thing. Secondly, we have a predominantly South Asian audience here. Sadly, the stigma is more prevalent amongst the South Asian population about seeking help in eating disorders. There is parental um, often a reluctance because the society is so closely integrated. Arifa, you mentioned that you were uh, isolated in a way as a smaller family unit, yeah. but most South Asian families have a wider connection yeah. and eating disorders are brushed under the carpet yeah. often. And there's a considerable delay when it comes to seeking help. Uh, two points that you potentially have highlighted directly or indirectly in the book. I'll stop there. Thank you. Excellent. Zubair, um, your last final words before I come to Arifa to finish the evening. Anything on eating disorders you wish to mention and also learning points that, that you got from the book or for other doctors and also quickly in 10 seconds introduce next month's book for us. <laughs> That's three questions for you. Um, in terms of the eating disorder, I'm, I'm just really glad that it was mentioned um, within the book because I think it's really important that people who read the book realise that it, it is an issue. Sadly, for, for for some maybe a lot of people out there, and so, and some of them, or maybe a lot of them, maybe never access the care that they need. And I'm glad that you mentioned it because I think people need to know that actually it does exist, and uh, they need to make sure they do access care. And hopefully, in the in the in the YouTube link, there'll be some links that we can maybe um, advise people to use. But also, if they do suffer or know a loved one who's suffering, it to make sure they get the right care. I appreciate obviously the journey for, for yourself and for you wasn't as easy after the referral, but I think that probably reflects the complexity of the condition. And, and hopefully in time, maybe we'll get better at it. Um, but, but obviously at this stage, maybe there's, it's not quite as good as we'd hope it would be. Um, second question was about Fahim. Second about learning point that you got learning for doctors or health Yeah, I think I mentioned this before, but I mentioned it again. It's mainly about the doctors, but, um, Three of doctors, or rather, oh, and we, we become quite scientific, I think, for him. And I think for me, it was a case of just making sure we remember the artistic side. I mentioned Osler again, he used to have that bedside 10 of books to read, um, which a lot of them were medical. If you look at them, well, actually, one was, but the vast majority were all Shakespearean works or other works. And he was one of the greatest physicians of the past century and a half or two centuries, or probably forever, really. Uh, but he really understood the need to actually learn the humanities as, as doctors. And I think that puts us in touch with our human side, but also the patient's human side to kind of make sure we bridge that gap between what we know clinically, but actually be there for the person and then have that positive response towards them and give them that positive experience. Uh, because they do, patients remember, don't they? They have a long memory. We may see 40, 50 people a day, and we might just think we've just gone through, but for, for, for them, those 10 minutes or whatever it might be is, is actually very, worthy because they've had a lot of anxiety they're bringing, a lot of concerns they're bringing to the table. And we're trying to address that in the time that we have. So I think that's something that I think for me was a good learning point. Um, lastly, the book for next month is called State of Fear by Michael Crichton. There's a, a picture somewhere famous, I'm not sure we're going to bring it up now, but maybe later. 
it's topical, I think, because we've got the big convention in Glasgow um, happening where they're going to get together and talk about the environment and, and, and address it. But there was a recent survey that came out showing lots of young people are really concerned about uh, the future and about concerns around uh, the environment. So I think maybe that'd be quite topical for them. I know folks are happy with me because it's a long book, um, but it's Michael Crichton, so hopefully he'll excuse me. Um, but it's about 600 pages long. But hopefully that'll be for next month, sometime in October. And he was a doctor, as uh, people may have but he didn't practice, but uh, obviously became more successful doing other things <laughs> uh, like ER shows, Jurassic Park and all the rest of it. Um, yes. Arifa, you do definitely get the final word. Uh, we've had a question come through, perhaps if you feel you wish to address that uh, or you choose not to. Uh, the question was, is the volume to do with grief or sentimentali sentimentalizing the element perhaps of neglect and guilt that was in the book? Um, I thought, this is obviously someone who's read the book, Fozia was not understood well enough to she died and probably other members were provided more priority and emphasis somewhat non-intentionally and now guilt is caught up during the grief and and that's led to some despair that's quite a uh, involved question there but uh, I don't know if you wish to have a stab at that and also um, learning points for doctors obviously you mentioned at the beginning the late delayed diagnosis that you perceived uh, for the TB which is obviously something that stayed with me but if there's anything else uh, uh, and anything, just to wrap up the, the evening mm. yeah the uh, it's interesting, the qu two questions. I don't quite understand what's being said, but it seems to, I don't know what the volume, what do you mean, is the volume more of grief or sentiment? I, I, I don't quite understand, but yeah, there's there was guilt, definitely, because there were uh, there was a difficult, you know, relationship within the family. When somebody has mental illness, there's, they're, they're actually quite difficult, you know, in, in terms of being close to and part of the family, it's, it's hard, it's hard on everyone, certainly hard on somebody who has a, 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 a acute uh, mental health condition. And it's hard on, on parents, on siblings. And there's a, I needed to be honest about that. Um, and the book doesn't, it's got hard edges. You know, there's an honesty there about unresolved issues and guilt and pain. And I didn't want to gloss over those because, and, and you know, and I want to admit admit to them, um, because that this is the reality for me. And a lot of as, you know, people have written to me and said this is the same. I've had a brother or a sister who had, who who has had mental health issues, and I I really relate to this. I relate to the anger. I relate to the guilt. I relate to you know the estrangements. So so it's honesty more than anything that I was trying to accomplish here. Um, you know, guilt is part of grief. So, and, and I wanted to admit that and, you know, and that's okay. You know, I'm not, I, I'm, I, that's all I can say about that. Um, learning points. I think I, what I would say is that I hope um, doctors, I think what I didn't always get was compassion. Um, I got some very inadequate, I felt it was very inadequate, you know, responses, first responses at doctors being very um, emotionally shut down and saying really inappropriate things by my sister's deathbed, I thought. And, uh, you know, I did, I told the hospital about this because I was ab absolutely appalled. And they, and the press officer said, well, you know, since COVID, she hoped that doctors had got better at that because that sadly um, they've had to encounter so much death and encounter you know family members who are in pain and so I think as hard it is as it is for doctors to learn that to learn to to speak to family members with compassion with you know um with the right tone because we take that away and remember it forever and I had such a difficult experience you know with several doctors that I hope that that changes that the compassion and just you know that em empathy and humanity can 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 stay that can be there uh, for, for families that are that are having you know having to to lose their loved ones in hospital, in a hospital space. Uh, and of course, um, I suppose diagnosis, just the checklists for TB, eth ethnicity, mental health issues, eating disorders, you know, I hope that 
the checklist work for someone else that goes into hospital like my sister and that they are diagnosed. So it's around diagnosis too. Thank you so much. Um, what a fitting way to end the evening. I've learned a lot. Um, there's a lot for me to think over and I'll say now definitely it's one of the best book clubs that we've had. Dr. Manafe, raising your hand, you don't need to raise your hand, you're the, the honorary professor here, please speak. <laughs> No, no, sorry. I thought you were uh, concluding, so I just wanted to say a few words, if it's okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. It's really an honor to be here. This is my first time ever in this sort of <laughs> event. Uh, and secondly, I, I just wanted to uh, mention an apology to Arifa, because one, at one point when I was speaking about TB, you seemed to reach out uh, for a tissue. I hope I didn't say anything to to upset you in any way. But, oh, no, um, I, I've got a cold. Don't worry. Okay, so uh, but, but I, because... The, from your book, uh, you talked about learning points. There are so many learning points. And one I've already highlighted about compassion and care and communication. But there's another very interesting learning point, which in your book, that is, um, as doctors, we should resist the temptation to uh, attribute many other illnesses to mental health uh, problems when they occur in the patient at the same time. We should not hang our hat totally on, as again, you've exemplified very nicely in the book, um, there was at some point you mentioned there was a tendency to say that Fazio had mental health issues and therefore this happened. And I think that's another interesting learning point. Um, there are several other important learning points. Another important learning point is whenever there is a problem with the diagnosis, you need many heads put together at the same time because high index of suspicion, but getting to the bottom of the problem is crucial. And that requires, and actually you may not be aware, Arifa, many of our hospitals, uh, certainly in our team, I can say in Lancashire Teaching Hospital, that, that is prevalent throughout the NHS, where we have multidisciplinary team meetings almost every day of the week. One for diagnostic dilemmas like this, we put many heads together because in Fazio's case, it was an extraordinary rare presentation of TB, an even rarer fact that hemorrhage occurred. And so it was really a challenging thing, if, if it helps you in any way. But uh, the importance that of does help. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, putting heads together and thinking and trying to get to the bottom of the problem with fresh eyes each time rather than just following on from what somebody else has done yeah. is absolutely crucial and conveying that to the family at every point and particularly when it comes to the far end unfortunately when we have to break bad news we all have to do a course on it um, to learn practically but that i think we need to do better thank and you that's so helpful to me actually what you've just said it's incredibly helpful and and i absolutely agree that at the end of that all of that process when the doctors have failed they not only need to do the course on how to be compassionate and deliver that news cl with clarity and openness and non-defensively and non without hostility um but but also to get back to the family with a full explanation, which we didn't have. That was probably the most painful part of my sister's death, that, the, that, that there, was, there was not a full enough reason quickly enough. And we had to chase for weeks and weeks and weeks. That's not, that's not good doctoring as far, as far as I'm concerned. And I don't know how unusual usual that was. The NHS is, you know, and doctors are very busy saving lives, but they also need to be aware of the fact that there's accountability and they owe a family a full explanation, you know, written down and given to us so that we can make peace with the, the horrific thing that, and shocking thing that's happened. Thank you, Arifa. Um, please, uh, for your time, uh, your generosity of spirit, uh, in providing me, gifting me the book even actually um, has been very kind. And really when we came up with this idea of this book club, it was books like this we wanted to feature uh, in order to make us better doctors. Um, yes, we, we've read the medical books, but actually it's through other bits and transposing that into our own medical practice. And this is one of those which lingers in the memory and will definitely will inculcate in our practice. So you've left a legacy there for us, as Zubair <laughs> mentioned. And also by having the discussion with Dr. Munafa, I hope you found the evening useful as well, uh, illuminating and more understanding. Amazing. 
Really, I have. Dr. Manava, I really want to thank you because, I mean, it's fantastic hearing about you and all this expertise, but in, you know, you've talked not only kindly, but actually you've taught me a lot. You know, there's lots of insight there that I, ha and, and, you know, just hearing your summary at the end there, you know, there's so much richness there that I'll go away and have really, really think about what you said. Excellent. Uh, so that's why I don't feel too bad uh, making the, the actual evening a bit longer for all of us because of those reasons. <laughs> those were my caveat. Dr. Malava, obviously, thank you. You're in India. It's past one o'clock. That's why I was trying to finish things. So thank you for your time. Uh, I, need to let you, it's over two oh. I need to let you <laughs> I need to let you sleep and Zabir. Thank you again. Uh, we look forward to next month's uh, book as well. Thank you, everyone who thank also you. attended in the audience. Uh, and I uh, hope we managed to answer the questions that are posed to us. Thank you so much. And a very good